Hi everyone. It is great to see you all here. Um, this is kind of an impromptu thing that we threw together. Um, this isn't really a class, this is more of a round table. So I want everyone to feel free to raise their hand and chime in and share experiences. And we're basically just gonna go around and we're gonna ask whatever questions we're dying for answers to and we're gonna share perspectives um, and experiences. So uh, my name is Zara. Um, my mundane name is Jessica. I am the corporate level DEI officer, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I will shorten that to DEI because it is an enormous mouthful and I don't want to say it a million times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do teach several classes and I'll do that on Zoom later, but this is the result of a conversation in a peerage round table uh, that Baroness Hillary was running. And I had asked everyone what they did to further inclusion and how they incorporated principles of inclusion into the way they lived their SCA lives um, and into the choices that they made. So we didn't quite have time to get through it. So we decided to make a little round table for everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and throw it to Gwen who's gonna introduce herself. Oh, and please just feel free to introduce yourselves at the beginning of when you start talking. I think it'll take too long if we just go around and you all forget anyway. So um, <laughs> just when you start talking for the first time, introduce yourself. Um, Gwen, go ahead. Hi, oh. uh, I gotta make sure, I'm, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see it's not muted. Hi. I goes we have more than one Gwen. Zara, which oh. Gwen did you mean? <laughs> I meant you, Gwen. Oh, okay. Sorry, Gwen, but then, we can totally talk. Whoever still had something to say in the peerage roundtable can definitely just pop in and talk. Everyone was talking. It wasn't just peers. Okay. So don't feel like you need to. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with Kari and then we'll just raise hands and Drew will okay. call on people. It'll be easiest. Sorry. That's all, all right. right. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> I'll see if I can change my, my name here from Carrie H to Fencer Gwen or something. So hi, I'm Water oh. Gwen. Water Gwen Phil Hewen uh, out of Ayrton. Um, so my part of this conversation with Zara is that I've been doing a lot of work, uh, research in how we can retain and build up lady fencers specifically. This started a number of years ago, uh, when Edmund and Katrin were last on the throne or two times ago. And they had said, how come we don't have as many women at the higher levels of fencing, the bronze ring, the MOD, when women make up like full 50, 51% of registered fighters. Um, and so what I was finding is that it's, you know, a bit of an inclusion problem. And in this context, a training problem. I, this is what I believe, that we're not taking into account female psychology, you know, the, the social messages that women get. And so we're not engaging with them in a way that's going to encourage them to stay. And so, you know, it's like, oh, yes, treat everybody equal. Equal doesn't mean, in this case, I'm going to treat you just like some dude. Because you're not a girl's not a woman's not some dude. So in some ways, it's kind of tailoring to your student, which I think is beneficial to anybody. Uh, but my research has been on female psychology specifically. That's it. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump in. I raised my hand, but I'm just gonna jump in. I think um, jump in if you want to, Zara. I don't. I mean, if you want to raise your hand, you can, and I'll call on you. But that seems weird. It's your thing, it Zara. <laughs> I know, but there's so many people. I want to keep okay. it me. Um, so to that end, I think it's important that we talk about something that I think of as tokenism and the idea that to be truly inclusive, we want to bring people in acknowledge that there are potential differences between us, but not other them for it. And I think that's a balance that we struggle with a lot in the SCA, mm -hmm. because what you're describing in the, okay, we want to bring someone in, but we don't want to ignore the fact that they've, they're coming from a different place, right? Mm -hmm. If we ignore that fact, then we're not able to really account for the best way to include them. But at the mm -hmm. same time, we don't want to bring them in and be like, we have a woman. She's yeah. right here. Look at her being womanly. Like that's not that's not what you want either. Um, yeah, like we see that across a lot of things, right? 
I mean, like, basically across every marginalized group. Oh yeah, like I hate when somebody says, oh, I don't see you as blank, I just see you as a person. It's like, well, what you're doing is you're negating their entire life's experiences as that, as that role, as a female, as a person of color, as somebody in the pride community saying, oh, I don't see you as gay, I just see you as a person. One that's a microaggression. I can define microaggressions if nobody, if somebody's not familiar with what I mean. And it's, just, it's erasing their entire experience and everything and every way they're treated positively and negatively because they're gay. Don't do that. Acknowledge people's life history, please. All right, Kai's got his hand raised. Go ahead, Kai. Are you muted? You're muted. Yeah, Kai, you're muted. There, now you're on mute. All right, here we go. I don't know why I was muted. Okay, um, yeah, I think, so what, what, what this sounds like to me as, you know, a, a, a man, a, you know, a cisgender man who has been, you know, who, who has been, been in the SCA long enough and is, is known enough that a lot of, you know, a lot of challenges other people face really kind of don't affect me, is that it's really less about equality and more about fairness. And that we, and that by acknowledge, you know, acknowledging differences isn't necessarily, can, can, and acknowledging differences can, can be a step towards creating an environment that is fair um, and th that is fair and thus and, and thus inclusive by by acknowledging people's differences, and, uh, but also also sort of celebrating them and looking for ways to looking looking for ways to to show that those differences are valued, so that people are inclined to stick around. Um, <clears throat> specifically in the Pentine community, with with the work that that Gwen has that, that Gwen has been doing, you know this is this is this is you know we we look at this as, as sort of a training. Uh, like uh, a, a, a training and pedagogical approach, right? The you know women think differently. Women women are are are, bio, are, are hormonally different than men are, um, and and this is you know this we're not we're not having gotten to like non-binary people yet. Um, we're still you know we're baby steps, right? But like understanding that and understanding where people are from and meeting them where they are. Is, is kind of the first step towards building a foundation that will encourage people to stick around. Because if you don't, and you just sort of disregard, if you just sort of disregard people's, people's experience, you don't, you, we've missed an opportunity to be well. That's, really, that's basically what I wanted to say about that. Yeah, I think that's, that's excellent. Um, we're actually touching on one of the things that I like to talk about really off the bat for people which is the difference between equality and equity, which you laid out really well, right? I'm just putting the terms to it. Uh, because equity really is about us focusing on what do people need to succeed, right? I can be mm -hmm. equal and I can say, thanks for coming guys. Everybody who showed up to this chat gets a medium sized t-shirt. That's equal, <laughs> right? Everyone here gets a medium t-shirt. That's awesome, that's equal, that's fair. But that's not going to work for most of us, right? And it's so equal. Equity, it's not necessarily fair. Right. That's a great well, example. Yes. It's it's only fair in the way we think about like that kind of childish fair of like you mm. get a cookie, so I get a cookie. Mm -hmm. When in reality, life is a lot more complex than that. So equity would be me going, all right, what size do people wear? Here's mm -hmm. your shirt. Um, so I think that's a great place to start, and that's a very practical way to kind of apply it to the SCA, right? Thinking about what people need and talking to them, opening the communication lines to, hey, I know you're having this difficulty, what can I do to help you? Rather than just assuming that what they need is the same as what everyone else might need. How, how would you- need before the difficulty comes up, right? I'm sorry? Like being, pro being proactive and saying, you know, welcoming someone and then trying to have that conversation before difficulty comes up. Yeah. How do you go, I mean, I have my own answer, but how do you go about having that conversation? Because a lot of times when you say, oh, just tell me what you need, either people don't know what they need or they don't know you well enough to speak up. I don't know if that's just a Midwestern trait or not, but <laughs> I've noticed that one a lot. 
I mean, either in fence and in heck as a professional, I'm a, I'm a therapist. So if I'm like, Oh, tell me what you need. They're like, well, I don't know. That's why I came here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or maybe Kai, you can speak to that. Cause you've, you're a very accomplished teacher and you've taught both men and women how to fence. So how have you sussed some of that out? I mean, I'm going to kind of break it up. So in terms of like, Hey, what do you need? I'm an attorney trained by, by, you know, by profession. And so when I am talking with a client, meeting with a client for the first time, really the, the first thing I, the first thing I, I look for is to, to, to tell me your story. Basically, what is, what, what, what has brought, what has brought you here? What are you looking to get out of, our, get out of your engagement with me? As as and you know as a professional advisor, um, and I think that that can work in the SCA context as well. If we ask the right questions, um, as a martial as someone who spends most of their time in, you know in the combat sports that we practice, a lot of I mean some of those questions are obvious. Why are you here? Because I want to learn this get with the sword. Okay, um, but there are there are other there are other questions that we and ask. And hey, hey folks, if I have no idea what that is. Yourself, please. Anybody who's not talking, please go on mute. Thank you. Okay. We know who the project manager is here. Um, sometimes these questions can be difficult. I remember when we had we had uh, a student who was who who, who was non-binary, and they were having some structural problems ex- you know, performing a physical task. Like that's part of fencing, and and so we eventually we we just kind of ask them like fundamentally like basically how are your bones structured because x x people have a different bone structure than x y people and that can kind of affect the way you lunge and thus affect how safe you are and so we teach people differently we, we, we teach differently and so like figuring out how to ask those questions and and you know ask someone like hey what do, basically like what do i need to know um and then like let them talk let them tell you um, because we don't necessarily know all of the right questions to ask, but I'm pretty sure that if, that, that, that you know, if, if a new person, it, um, the new person knows themselves pretty well, they will tell us. Um, and then it's really on us to be on us as people who are running these, who are running these activities, whether it's fight practice or dance practice or, you know, AS class, whatever, whatever that is to, to create an environment where people feel comfortable telling their story. How to do that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> except, except in, in, in my, my particular limited sphere, um, but I see many, many people who do a lot of other things, who probably have much, who are probably much more knowledgeable about that in their context than I am. Okay, we've got uh, Ed Crane, who's SCA name in my chat every night, and this, her name still escapes me. But go ahead and unmute. It's Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And I offer perspective from a non-fighting, like a general event perspective. Um, so I, I work a lot with um, accessibility from like a disability standpoint. Um, and to chime in with exactly what you're saying, Kai, I think that if, even if you don't know what the right questions are to ask, when you show the respect from the get-go, that makes people feel comfortable that goes so far. You know, as soon as they see that you respect their diversity, they will immediately feel more comfortable in being involved and being like, okay, I can ask a question. Um, so I do think it is awesome to be like, what do you need? But sometimes people just, they're, they're not comfortable being like, well, I need X, X, X you, know, like, you know, going mm-hmm. down the list. When they know that you're there and you're willing to respect their needs, from the get go, I think that goes along. Well. Yeah, no, and 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 like your your Majesty is one of the things that that you've done very well as I thought it is creating an environment when when you know when you speak to the populace that is welcoming and that makes people comfortable. Um, I, I I hear that a lot from from people who don't you know who who don't know you um, and. Um, I was, maybe maybe you have a perspective on, on on the things that you do to create that environment. You're on mute. Okay, <laughs> May I? Is it all right? I don't. And thank you very much for your kind words. For me, it's just creating a a true environment where 
you're talking to this person as a person, no matter what, and just trying to see where they're coming from things. And when we talked about whole asking, even though they may not know what they want, but you just talk to them first. People are so eager to give advice at first, other than just making people feel at ease before you even get talking about things. I don't know if that really answers the question, but that's what I try to do. It, it, it really does. And it, I mean, it, it, this goes back to something Gwen, you said before, is like meet them where they are. You know, like we are a different environment than a lot of like martial arts schools or, you know, dance schools where people are paying a fair amount of money to be there. We have a very low barrier to entry. And so it's really like the things that we do as people are what are going to get people to fundamentally, I think what are going to get people to stick around. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Um, I think you're, again, touching on a really important concept of we need to expect people and create the space for them before they're here and lacking it, right? Um, some people won't feel comfortable saying, I'm not getting this and I really need it. And some people will look and if they don't see a space for themselves, then they won't come at all, right? Why would I come and expect to remake the society of all of these people to be something that I need, right? It's a big ask for people. And there's a lot of people and there's a lot of personality types that just are not going to engage with us if we are not already saying, look, there is a space for you here. Um, His Majesty has, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was Baroness Wars, when he took his squires, he was very careful to kind of explain everything that he was doing, which was great because there were a lot of people for whom that was probably the first time they saw any kind of squiring or anything like that. And he didn't really explain it in a way that was, you know, outside of, he was just narrating what he was doing. It was great. Um, but it doesn't call them out. It lets them enjoy it. It lets them participate. It lets them understand. But it doesn't make them feel like, oh, hey, new people, come here. We'll tell you. We'll tell you what's going on. And that's not even all that bad, right? I mean, we can make a space for newcomers point or something like that. And we can say, hey, new people, come here. But people don't remember to do that at every step. Um, I also want to point out in the chat, um, so Elizabeth? Um, saying that inclusion isn't a one-time thing, but an ongoing project. Very accurate, right? Inclusion is not the award that we're going to be like, look, it's there. I was inclusive. Done. Number one. It's just not realistic, right? It's an ongoing thing. And as we continue to live and grow together, people are going to keep needing different things. Um, and we're going to get new people. The entire point of this idea of being inclusive is that we're attracting people from all walks of life. And so as those people come in, we're going to need to keep asking these questions. What do you need? What is your background and how can I help you feel comfortable in your experiences here? Um, so I'm going to throw it back to Fencer Gwen. Right, I'll lower my hand then. Um, so one thing I also saw was how do we evolve our questions, evolve our inclusivity? Um, you know, like as I said with microaggressions, those can be statements that people mean well and they're not aware that this is an insulting question or demeaning or things like that. So I think that's a question is how do we, how do we help people who maybe don't have a lot of training or a lot of personal experience into coming into that and going, okay, give it an extra moment of thought before you ask that question. And as Zara had said, how do we just show right off the bat, hey, we're inclusive. Um, one of the ways that, one of the few ways I know how to do that is if I see a new, new person, I go, hi, I'm Gwen, my pronouns are she, her. Is it, that, is it a big deal for me? No, but it could be a big deal for that person who goes, oh, she, she's onto something. She knows this now. She's given me the space. And they may, be, they may be like, oh, you know, I'm cisgender or not. And it kind of sets the tone. Like Jim had said, when we had the person at our practice for a bit who was non-binary, that's what we started off with. And they said, oh, my pronouns are they, them. Got it. Nothing more needed to be said on the subject. And we just rolled with it. 
but is there anybody who's had questions or had experiences maybe when they first joined the SCA that were either really positive or maybe really negative? It was maybe like, oh yeah, people don't say this or yeah, do this. I'd be curious to hear from some other people. I have, but they're sawing at my house right now. And that was my incredibly noisy background noise a while ago. They're laying flooring in my front hall, which is literally right there. So they're cutting pieces of wood and then pounding them in. So I apologize. It sounds like something very sexy and exciting is going on when they're pounding the flooring in, but that's not it. Um, but quickly, before they start pounding flooring again anyway, um, I will say that one of the things that I found helpful when I was learning to fight, both I fought heavy a hundred years ago and I fought rapier not that long ago, was that rather than saying, tell me what you need, people, the, the people who worked with me to help train me would say things like, okay, you're a new fighter. In my experience, people who are new fighters have these kinds of questions. Do any of those sound like something that you also might have a question about? Because like you said early on, Gwen, you don't know what you don't know a lot of times, right? So having somebody say, hey, I recognize that you're new and you might not even know what questions to ask. Here's some typical newbie questions. Which one of those do you have? Or which one of those sounds like, oh yeah, I was wondering about that. That helped me out a lot because um, I didn't, I had no clue what to ask. I was a horrible fencer. I died literally within seconds every time, but I had fun learning and um, I have lots of good memories of, of that time because of questions like that. His Majesty has his hand raised. So I had one experience, it was a long time back when I was just an unbelt. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay. And it was back when I was trying to get on the unbelts team. I remember Sir Sabah, he was still squire at the time, he came out of the meeting and he said they were all not sure why they wanted, why they wanted me on the squad, the team, because I wasn't well known at that time. And they were saying, was it because he looked like you? And this was something I had an interaction with knowing that that was maybe a thought that was within the SCA. However, through talking with him and not wanting to just go around being angry, we talked it out more and we started to try to figure out why people think that. And the sad thing is you can't change some people's minds, but knowing that it was out there helped me be more aware. And it didn't, I didn't let it make me angry. I just made it, I just tried to show that there's other sides to things. I want to also, before we keep going, does everyone know what a microaggression is? Is there anyone that wants me to explain that or go over that at all? I, watch I, saw, Kai, I saw Kai doing that, so go for it. Okay, okay. So um, I will not tell the usual story because I do cover this in one of my classes, but to be brief, a microaggression is an action or a statement, um, usually that plays into some sort of a stereotype or some sort of assumption about someone um, without necessarily meaning to do it. It can be intentional, but it's not, it's not as simple as being a passive aggressive statement. So it's, it's a slight, it demeans or marginalizes the recipient of the slight, but you might not know that you're doing it. So I'm gonna give you some examples of them because that's the easiest way to explain it. And these are all things that people sent in to me. So I did not make these up. These are all things that people were told like in the SCA. Um, so saying things like, oh, you don't look Jewish. Or, wow, you are really articulate to various people of color or, Oh, I would never have guessed you were gay. Things like that, that make it sound as though the expectation was somewhere else. Um, there is a duke in this kingdom that actually was at a TOC. He's very well known, he's very skilled. And an unbelt who did not know him very well came up to him and said, it is such an inspiration to see the old fighters getting out here with everyone else. Oh, just so inspiring. It's those little statements. Um, 
you can probably think about several different times you've heard something like that where someone made this little like eh but it was so little you can't really call it out without seeming a little like you're overreacting but when you hear it over and over and over it starts to wear on you people really like to touch my hair i change my hair a lot people like to touch all of them people i don't know like to come up to me in stores and touch my hair people at sca events like to pull on my hair it gets really frustrating but if I turn around and I flip out on the next person that touches my hair, they're gonna be like, oh my God, I just liked your hair. Because they won't know the weight of what I'm coming at with it. So that's the microaggression. Um, that I think encompasses a lot of the very small problematic statements that happen in the SCA, so. All right, we've got Mistress Hillary, and then Mistress Gwen, and then Elisabetta, and then Lulu. I muted when I meant to unmute. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Hillary Blankford, uh, Baroness of Ayrton in the Midlands. Um, this is more of a, a, I don't know if it's me trying to be like, oh, here's an idea. Um, but it's something that I'm working on personally is while I'm working with um, newcomers. I don't do it as much as I used to, but that was a big part of my life for a long time with the MSCA, is to as I do so now, I'm trying to really look at body language um, more so than I have in the past to see if people are really listening or if they're looking uncomfortable. If if I'm making assumptions, and sometimes you can tell tell by body language, and I'm not an expert. I'm trying really hard to be better at it um, because I think that there are there are those those subtle cues that will kind of help with. Um, this is not going where I thought it was, or this person is not being receptive to this. And I will try really hard to just to ask. And sometimes just being honest, I, I, I just, you look, you look like you're a little uncomfortable. I'm sorry. And which do I need to take a step back? Why, why don't you talk for a moment? And a couple of times that's saved me from making a worse mistake. Um, and has given, you know, obviously sometimes I also get the, no, 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 it's all good. Um, but there has been a couple of times where it's, it's kept me from digging the hole deeper that I did not intend to dig. So Aggie, it sounds like you're saying that when you notice, oh, maybe I've made a misstep, to just come out and say, I think I've made a misstep. Oh yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't like to, First of all, I am just my face. There, there, I don't, <laughs> I don't hide things, right? And if I look like I'm making somebody uncomfortable, they know that I look like I'm making somebody uncomfortable because it is all over my face. And I, I just kind of like to just be like, oh wow, did I screw up? Um, and throw it out there, and and it's been helpful more than once. Okay, next is Mistress Gwen. Hey everyone, um, Gwen Brown Nocturnal. I, I renamed myself on there, so we all have distinctive uh, he, she, it, they. I'm Gwen Brown Nocturnal, CNI Laurel. And uh, I guess the question I wanted to ask is a similar one that I posed to a professional group uh, around the table I'm going to be participating in on Friday. And the observation I wanted to offer first was, oftentimes a group is measured in large part of its success and how well prepared they are for any emerging trends in, uh, you know, segregating people or, you know, microaggressions, macroaggressions. I've been in IT for many, many years and a woman in IT back when all you needed to do was be able to spell IT to get a job, I've, you know, been around it for a long time. But right now, I wanted to understand what the Mid-Realm is doing to address the absolute racist and hate uh, uh, verbiage that's coming out from our uh, nation. You know, Trump has made such racist comments and is fueling, you know, hate crimes against Asian Americans. And I am Asian American. I'm actually technically legally Asian. And, um, you know, I'm seeing articles now unfold where people are being attacked in the streets. You know, two women, and I raised my family in Naperville. 
great suburb of Chicago, uh, probably a little bit more right wing than left. And the article I saw on Reddit today was two women attacked an Asian American in Naperville. I would have never guessed that. South side of Chicago, you know, that's, it's unfortunate that their stereotype is out there. But Naperville is about as, you know, suburban of, as you can get. And you have people attacking Asians. So in the preparedness of the mid-realm, as often we will seek some comfort in the groups that we participate. Um, is there anything being done to help those who may be getting attacked? Kai, you and I share a similar uh, culture. Um, are we prepared if anything, anything like that happens? Um, I guess I'm going to jump in and answer a little bit to that, right? So definitely addressed to you. Yes, thank you. We have not specifically discussed the most recent kind of rash of hate crimes because it is the result of a rhetoric that arose from the COVID-19 kind of situation and the sphere of coronavirus and everyone being so afraid. Um, in the SCA, there are a lot of policies and specific guidelines that will cover any sort of hate that happens at an SCA event or in an SCA specific space. So the bullying and harassment policy is one. We also very distinctly call out any sort of discrimination or discriminatory behavior on the basis of race, sex, gender, age, et cetera. Um, so there, there are already allowances for it across our current Kaporan governing documents. But what I do kind of want to discuss a little bit is the problem of the rhetoric itself and the dog whistling that's associated with it. So a dog whistle is, is a message that may be subvert and intended for a specific group. Um, and it could even be subconscious, right? But when we put rhetoric into the world that says it's okay to attack this group, we should not when we start seeing attacks on that group, um, which is why we try very hard within the SCA to make sure that our language is aligning with what kind of behavior that we want to see within our core values. So the type of language you are talking about before anyone gets actually hurt or discriminated against, but even the idea of changing language to something like calling it the Chinese virus or something like that, would be something that I think is covered under the bullying and harassment policy. Just hearing that language within the SCA spaces can be problematic enough that it needs to be addressed and nipped in the bud before that kind of rhetoric can lead to more hateful behavior. Sure, but if I may respond, um, often they won't come out. They'll be afraid to say anything. What is being done as an outreach to any of them or offering? maybe is a better way to put it. Because yes, I've been in the SA a long time. I know that, uh, I, and I mentioned on our peerage round table that it's shocking and saddening that um, what I once took and ran my group as the nocturnal fellowship, you know, to be all inclusive of people, it's sad to see the evolution of how things have become. Um, but when it's emerging and trending and you've got leaders uh, spewing hate, what are we doing as a community to reach out to those Asian Americans to help reinforce that we're inclusive? I think it's probably worth going back over some of our bullying and harassment policies and making those very front and center. I think right now there hasn't been a lot of verbal activity about it because there's no SCA activity happening. And so one of the limitations that we face is that at the society level, the bullying and harassment policy, corpora, all of that only applies in SCA spaces. We are very, very limited when people engage mm -hmm. in hate speech in private spheres. And right now we're all pretty cut back as far as SCA specific places. I think if you are someone who is witnessing this happen to someone else, and I mean this general you, right? If anyone here is witnessing this happen to someone else, reach out to them let them know what their options are. Offer to be the intermediary for them. 
because some people just don't have the bandwidth right now, right? This is a very emotionally trying time. And some people will not have the bandwidth to just say, okay, well, you can report it to your kingdom seneschal or your local seneschal or even elevate it to society. That'll be too much. So saying, here are your options. Do you want me to craft this letter? Do you want me to have a phone call with all of us? Offering to be that intermediary as much as possible, I think is a good way to both get involved, but continue to center their comfort and what they want to see out of the situation. So they can guide it and you can help move it forward. Yeah, and, and as I st stated at the start of my question is really, you know, as an outreach, um, the measure of a society's success is largely in how prepared they are. And it's just some food for thought, as I'm shocked at the articles I'm reading, that we may want to be more cognizant of this trending toward hate crimes against Asians. So I, I, maybe we're not prepared right now to deal with it. And quite frankly, been on a lot of those receiving, you know, the one point part of the board, you know, where you got the letter in the mail that probably took somebody a lot of emotional toil even to be able to write it to them. And you kind of closing the door after the horse is out. It would be nice to be prepared in advance for the trending that we're seeing, the shocking trend that's happening uh, so that um, we are known as a society that is inclusive rather than just a reactionary one. I don't know, Your Majesty, is that, and that may be beyond the scope of what Kingdom can do, but it, I'm just uh, responding to articles I'm reading and offering, you know, maybe we'd want to be prepared. Sure. The part of our preparedness is when we start to look at our anti-bullying policy, and it's not to the level where we can't influence outside the SCA as much as we want to, but as soon as it comes within our SCA, we have a very zero tolerance where this is not it's all allowed here. And then at that point, we can still reinforce our statement saying we have things in place that this is not allowed. Everyone should feel safe here. Whether or not everyone does, we still do our best, but zero tolerance in that part. So I just wanted to, um, Tyrion has something that he thinks is relevant as that Seneschal, and then if we're ready, our, if, if we're ready to move on, then I'll announce who's next in the. Yes, thank you very much. Um, as both a Seneschal and as someone who is married to a person of Asian heritage, I am very aware of this. And if I see or hear anybody doing anything like that at an SCA event, I will come down on them with Odin's thunder. I have zero tolerance for that kind of horseshit at this point. Unfortunately, that is reactive rather than proactive, but it's what I got right now. Well, and that's what I was going to say, um, Tyrion, is I, I, I appreciate the idea of being proactive, but until a bigot outs themselves, we don't know they're a bigot. So I, I don't know how we can do more than be reactive other than have these policies in place and have a plan. And, and I maybe that's what Gwen is talking about, having a plan so we're talking about it on this call, but do we need to, to have something out there that says, if you see this, you should do, here's the steps you can take. Um, I don't know, but I mean, there's lots of people who I found out are bigots and I was surprised or shocked. So I don't know. Yes, Maggie, I, if I may reply real quick. Yes, I'm, thought, I'm thinking about heightened awareness in a current time, shocking time, um, so that we are prepared. Um, and it brings it to the forefront of how we are preparing for it. So really quickly, um, I would like to talk more about this outside of the call. So please go ahead and reach out to me. Um, I do have information on bystander intervention that's gonna be offered as a class because we are seeing this in particular is a problem because of what's happening now. But the idea that people are being attacked is, is unfortunately much more common than we'd like it to be. Um, and so we, we are putting together material so that people can learn how to engage safely. So let's talk about that more afterwards, but I know a bunch of people have hands up, so. All right, we've got Elisabetta, then Lulu, then Sabine, and then Fencer Gwen. I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> 
I had something to say like three points ago. Sorry. <laughs> you can ignore me. It's all good. <laughs> all right. Who's next? Is Lulu? It's actually not going to be Lulu talking. It will be Baron Honda who joined the group late. Hi, everybody. My name is Honda. Um, I am Baron of Carrick Bon. I did want to just address the idea of microaggressions. A lot of people think that microaggressions tend to be, um, you know, across, um, what am I trying to say? Racial lines. Across racial lines. But there's a lot of microaggressions that, if you introspect, um, are actually within the culture itself. Like, uh, so I am an Asian, right? And it's very common for other Asian people to ask each other, oh, you know, what kind of Asian are you? Um, and a lot of the times I'm assumed to be Filipino. Um, and when I say Chinese, they say, oh, you know, I wouldn't have expected that, so on and so forth. But it's something to remember when you're thinking about microaggressions that even within your own, uh, within your own race and culture, there are these things. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, that's important. Yeah, yeah. And, and they can be positive sometimes, but for the most part, they are negative. <laughs> um, and that's all I really wanted to touch base on. Okay, we have Sabine and then Fencer Gwyn and then Illador. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Hi, Hi I'm Sabine. Um, I'm the DEI officer over in Artemisia. So nice to meet y'all virtually. Um, <laughs> so I kind of, I'm, I came in late and kind of what I'm hearing is a lot of what is important about inclusion is knowing that people are protected. And I think a big part of that is protecting with permission. Like I think a lot of people can get sort of offended for other people. And so it's, it's one of those balances that we have to strike of like, hey, that's, I see that as a microaggression. The other person who it's directed to may not. And so how do we, how do we deal with those kinds of situations where we could educate, but the, the other person doesn't find it's a problem? And I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up just for food for thought as well. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's just kind of my thought. Any, any thoughts on that? Um, I will hop in again. <laughs> um, so I'm so glad you're here. It's good to see you. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great, a great question to bring up. It's very difficult, right? Um, we want people to feel comfortable stepping in and saying, hey, that wasn't cool. But at the same time, we don't want people monopolizing the conversation or drawing attention to something that might not be a problem for the person. So I think the easiest way to do that would just be kind of delayed communication, right? So a situation happens where there's some kind of microaggression that happens in a conversation that you perceive. Pulling the person aside later and very gently saying, hey, I heard this, were you okay with that? Do you want me to say something? And if they say, ah, you know, it wasn't great, but I'm fine, respect that and don't pursue it. But maybe the next time you hear something like that, saying, oh, hey, let's, let's not say it like that. Something very casual is sometimes just as good as actually sitting down and getting into it. Because for many people, because it's unintentional, they're not looking for, a castigation, right? You don't need to lecture them about what they've done wrong necessarily. But interrupting the behavior and then making the space to later come back and just be like, hey, just so you know, you know, this, this can sometimes get taken this way. And I just, I'm assuming you didn't know that, but I want you to, want you to know that that's a potential problem. Um, that's how I do it, but there's no cut and dry way, right? We are all going to make mistakes. And that's kind of just something you got to accept from the outset that even with good intentions, you might misstep and you just got to be okay with that. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important part because I think within the SCA, we sort of have this culture of even slight perfectionism, right? We do have kind of this hierarchy system and, and I think there's a lot based around that. And so it can be looked at as though we're not allowed to make mistakes. And I think, when we are allowed to make mistakes and allowed to fail and deal with our own 
feelings of rejection, I think that will help create even like a safer SCA. Thanks. Next is Spencer Gwen and Illidor, and then His Majesty had his right hand raised, and then he put his hand down. <laughs> All right, well, Kai asked this question. This is one I was going to address anyway, in terms of, you know, okay, so what do we do on the ground? You know, let's say, you know, we did hear something and maybe the person it was directed to doesn't, maybe it doesn't bother them, but maybe it bothered me. So I'll say, hey, you know what? I didn't like that. Here's why or whatever. Um, but a practice I try to do in terms of being welcoming is, you know, somebody new comes to frenzy practice. Hey, welcome to the SCA. This is the SCA. This is great. And I'll say things like, you know, thing I love about the SCA is this, this, and this isn't tolerated, which communicates if that's you, shut your mouth because we don't want to hear it. Um, and then for people, you know, for better or worse, we do have a hierarchy, at least in our, at least in the middle, in the mid realm. And I'm a bronze ring. I've got some clout just by having that scarf on my arm. So I do tell my new people, because I love our new people. I said, you know, if anything happens and you want it addressed, come tell me, because I will take action. And I'm also very close to people who are even higher up in the hierarchy. So I can go to them and go, hey, look, this happened. Let's deal with it. Because I remember being a new person and going, well, pff, nobody's going to listen to me. I'm a noob. I'm a nobody. And then learned, no, you know people. You've got people who've been in the society longer or have pointy hats or whatever. And so I try to show the new people, look, utilize your network, <laughs> if that makes sense. And just say, hey, look, we don't tolerate this. I don't tolerate this. And I will go to bat for you. Sometimes whether or not you want me to, because if I'm offended, I'm addressing it. That was it. Next is Illidor, then His Majesty, then Odette. Hi, I'm Elidor. I am uh, the Kingdom Seneschal of Ethelmark, which is, uh, I got, so I have two things. The first one is in regards to um, the comments about what do we do if we see people doing racist, sexist, other terrible things along those lines. And the answer is uh, go to your Seneschal or if you're in Ethelmark, go to me directly and I will handle. I promise that's how it's gonna roll, ill or handle. So, but the other question I have along those lines is why is this um, why is this not really understood or known? Like, uh, like I have a two part question. Really, the first part is is like I hear a lot of people talking about like these are things that you can do if you deal have to deal with someone who's being microaggressive or just flat out racist or other terrible things. And I want to know if it's I feel like it should be known that you have a place to go to, right? You have the seneschals that you, it, depending on where you are, you can go up the hierarchy all the way up to the society and the president of the SCA about this. And I kind of want to know, like, if people feel okay with with doing that. And then the second question I have is getting away so much from like the punishment aspect or corrective corrective that's a, the corrective aspect and how how do we how do I make how do I make people better how do I encourage better behavior from the get-go what do I do to help make my kingdom and the SCA more inclusive what's my biggest bang for my buck thank you very much for letting me chat next is his majesty unless you have a response for that Zara do you want to yeah, I'll jump in really quick. Um, I'm glad you're here. You're always welcome to come and chat. Um, I want to pull a couple things out of chat because there is a simultaneous, very fruitful chat conversation. Um, and something that Sada, 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 I think it's Sada, Sada pointed out is um, stating up front the expected behavior is great, right? We put our bullying and harassment policy up at events because we want people to know at the door that certain behavior is unacceptable and we will take action if you are involved in it. We should probably expand that, in my opinion. That is something that I'm pushing to do. I'd like our core values or slightly more informational behavior to be up there. Um, and I'm also a big fan of the do this and not the don't do this. 
right? I'm a very big fan of saying, this is who we should be, instead of just outlining all of the behavior that we shouldn't engage in. So on a personal level, I like to tell people what they should be doing. So coming right out and saying, hey, if you see this problem, yes, do this, blah, 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 um, is a lot easier. And I think it sticks better for people than just giving them a laundry list of things that they should never do. Because there's a lot of things you should never do, right? I could go on for the next 15 hours about shit you shouldn't do. But when we're actually giving people a plan to move forward, I think giving them the tools that they need to be effective is ultimately the highest benefit. In terms of why people don't know things, I mean, we're never really clear about it, right? There's a lot of situations that happen where people don't know what their options are. One of the classes I teach is specifically geared to go through the governing docs and pull out the areas that tell people the power that they have to deal with bigotry, to deal with uncomfortable situations. And every time I teach it, there's at least one person, often a seneschal of a local group or even higher, who did not realize that they have the power to just go up to someone at an event and say, you are making people uncomfortable and you need to leave. The event steward has that power. People don't necessarily know. And because they don't know, it's not always able to be effectively applied. There is a situation in Antier where a racial slur was thrown around. The event steward was a person of color. She was very understandably not really in a mental space to be able to pursue that hierarchy. But there were six other people at the event who also would have had the power to say, hi, you need to leave now. And none of them did it. So making sure that people know the power they have and what they're empowered to do is something that I'm trying to work on through classes. I don't know why people don't know it. We don't really have a central training program. Maybe we should. All right, next is His Majesty. That was a very good point, Zara. And it's hard because I think one of the biggest things we have to learn in society, or at least I can talk from the mid-realm per se, is the consistency level. We gotta stay consistent on what we're talking about. And there's some things, and it's hard being a black male in the society, I'm 33 years age, and there's some things you've been dealing with during your whole life at the age of eight. I recently decided that I'm not gonna take the whole compliment or backhanded compliment that you're the whitest black guy I know anymore because it robs me of my heritage. And it was my friend, a good friend that told me this. He's old school, I'm not gonna say his name, but we had to have a really hard to heart talk. And it was hard. It made no one, feel uncomfortable, no one feel comfortable. But after I bring that up, I have to tote the line now and I can't say it's okay for one person not for other. I have to make it a straight and narrow thing. And some people aren't able to do that. And I wasn't mad at him. I just said, hey man, that's what was going on. And he's like, hey, I'm sorry to mean that. I'm like, I understand that, but that's not cool. And that's something that we're just gonna have to see. And it's not just for black and white, it's not for, it's for Asian, everything It's across any boards, ageist, all these things we have to do. But consistency, I think is gonna be important. And right now, I guess I'm king of the mid-realm. But I try to say always that it's like, you can access and access me anywhere. From the newest person, from the person that's been in the SA for a long time, I just try to be accessible. And I know I'll stumble sometimes, but we just gotta be consistent. But that's all I have to say. Okay, next is Odette and then Lulu. Okay, um, I think I'm, what I'm trying, I was gonna try and answer a little earlier, but I decided that since I would just throw it in now. Um, we find, and this is, I can't speak society-wide. I've been in the Midwest now for a while. So there is some, some people who are less assertive and some people that are more assertive. And for the people who feel that are assertive and feel comfortable to step forward when someone else needs that help and notices what would we would possibly call third party harassment when even the person who's getting the microaggression is not saying is saying eh, it's not bothering me that still needs to be addressed because it's going to hurt somebody else that there is a there's a technique that we can use to kind of course correct the person who is doing this without them feeling like they're gonna throw back on their on their heels and throw back 
uh, some defense. And it's the technique is a catalyst conversation where you start by aligning what your objective is, you know, what you're trying to, to communicate, explore your perspectives after you've, you know, you've aligned everybody's on what page you're talking, what we're talking about. You explore the perspectives. You are not putting your ideas forward. You're kind of like, okay, so why are you, what, what brought you to say this? Um, then kind of clarify the understanding. Um, and then you kind of like, can I share something, you know, volunteer the, here, let me share what I'm understanding. And then kind of walk away with some sort of action plan, some sort of empowering action that that person could then follow later and say, hey, how about next time we try whatever you've come out of this conversation with. Um, it's not, it, it, it diffuses the converse, the, the situation a little, it takes the, uh, the, I'm feeling attacked. So I'm going to really dig in and stand, you know, stand on that hill and die on it. Um, versus walking away with what they feel is like a win-win. And it's you know and i'm always available if anybody wants to go through what what all the steps and practice catalyzing conversations and all this stuff i am always available and i am of course a more assertive person and one of my skill sets is to help people who are less assertive find that assertive bone in their body to come forward and express themselves can i say as the therapist that i strongly approve of this method <laughs> This is great. That's it's. A, I'm sure there's a name for it, but that's a very therapeutic way of approaching things. So I think that is great, and I would love to see a class on that that really lays that out for people, so they they can practice it and all that stuff. So wonderful, Odette. I would love to see that. Okay. Um, next is Lulu, then Sada, then Sabine, then um, Walk is unable to raise his hand because he's on a device that can't let him do that. So he'll go after Sabine. And then Kai, and I just want to point out that we're already at seven o'clock and there's a hard stop at 7.30 for this, uh, this gathering. So we can do this again, I'm sure, um, when we find time in the schedule for it. But uh, Lulu's next. All right, so it actually is Lulu this time. Um, I'm Lady Rishi, my Monday name is Lulu. Lulu is much easier for people to remember. Feel free to call me either of them. Um, we have had an influx of new members into Carrick Bond as of recently. and we have found that providing allyship for everyone is a big step in keeping people happy and wanting to come back. And I don't mean just allyship for LGBTQ+, I mean allyship for everybody. So you find out what's important to people, you help them pursue those goals, but you also make it clear that they are your friends outside of the SCA, and they are your friends to help fight their battles. Uh, Sada and I have had this discussion a couple times. As a white middle-aged lady, I have a lot of privilege that some of my friends do not have. I also don't have daily battles. I have a lot more energy to help people fight those battles who maybe just don't even want to fight with it anymore. Those microaggressions get really, really old. People get tired, and it's a daily grind for some people. So I don't mind stepping in and being that wall for them or being that shield or taking up the fight for them because I don't do it all the time. Remembering that people get tired and that they don't want to fight is a good step to, to or it's a good thing to remember when people tell you, oh, it didn't really bother me because it probably did. They just don't want to fight anymore. And that's where you have to step in with your privilege and say, no, this is really not allowed and it's not just you, but I will fight this you don't need to worry about this anymore. And then you let them go back to doing whatever they're doing and now it's your thing. But that might be the only thing you have to do that day, whereas they've already had a conversation like that six times in 20 minutes. So remembering that it's not a problem, these are people, it goes a long way in being able to actually help influence the situation. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay, next is Sada. Oh, 
Go ahead. Can't hear you, Sano. You're still muted or something. Yeah, I think he's still. No, he's unmuted, but it's not coming through. Do it through performative dance. <laughs> <laughs> if your computer has a microphone, sometimes the headphones are not working for it. So if you just, yeah, there you are. I see. It decided the microphone was attached to my headphones. Okay. My apologies. All right. So I have, uh, I am also in the barony of Karagban, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, so there are two very quick things I wanted to mention that have kind of already been touched on because of our format. Um, the first is when talking about um, authority, hierarchy, and interrupting activities. Um, and one of that, those, those major things is needing to communicate at a hierarchical level who has not just the power to interrupt, but who has the responsibility to be in charge of the safety of their people. So that needs to be some of the core information that we distribute to seneschals, coronets, royalty, uh, chatelaines, um, and, well, if I had my way, anyone who has any kind of officership whatsoever. Um, but that that your positions come with responsibility in addition to the power that Fencer Gwen mentioned. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention uh, may have already been discussed. I was late to the meeting. I'm terribly sorry. Um, there was recently on the uh, DEI Facebook group uh, that I imagine many people here are also in some way aware of um, about uh, the portrayal of certain um, non-white, non-European groups by um, usually white people. There, there was a, a very large blow up of, on this topic. Um, could you turn them down? Sorry. Um, in any case, this, this blow up contained a lot of white people policing other white people in a way that is active allyship, but also without like an awareness basis of whether or not they had factual information or whether they were benefiting the other people who were of the, the culture um, being discussed, if that makes sense. Um, like I saw several people who were indigenous because it was about indigenous North American portrayals um, saying that they were tired of other white people telling other white people what could and could not be done about their cultures. So that makes like an added layer of, of difficulty for those who try to be active allies. Um, so that the, it, it's not a cut and dry bust in with your knowledge base so much as bust in to interrupt the behavior and process like that lo that layer of interrogation, like um, I'm sorry, I did not catch Odette's title, but like Odette was mentioning. So that's all I wanted to say. So. I think um, what you're pointing out is fantastic. I did see that conversation. Uh, I did not get involved. I actually I teach a class on cultural appropriation, and particularly with indigenous cultures, that is that is one of the advanced right you're gonna need to do a lot of research a lot of work you're gonna need to really engage with this culture as it exists now to ensure that you are respectfully doing anything with it and there are many cultures that are just like do not touch we don't want you reenacting it we don't want you presenting the art we will do it ourselves in which case hey that's something that you can facilitate as well um but interrupting the behavior without engaging in the educational portion can be really useful when you are not the person who should be providing that education or i should say originating that education you can provide other people's educational work because yeah. people do they do the work the articles are out there the information is out there people from these marginalized cultures have put in work and you can be the person to say 
look what this person is saying. But I think it's a, it's a great point you're bringing up to avoid being a person saying, hey, I'm saying it, so you should believe me and you should listen to me regardless of my background and taking it to a place of, I'm gonna interrupt this behavior, I'm gonna provide you with these resources that are from this culture, this is what they think. I think that's a great point. Okay, next we have Sabine and then Walk and then Kai and then Elizabeth. Um, so just a few things that I wanted to say based on, you know, this conversation is one, it's, it's amazing to hear how much improvement and how better we just all want to be as a society. Like I hear that throughout the board, we want things to progress, we want things to be better. And, and I think that overall message is important to communicate. And I think what's also really important is that we, especially right now with everything that's going on with the COVID-19, is to practice like that grace and that patience with one another uh, because it, it is a trying time and change is difficult. I think a lot of us are experiencing just personal change. And as we're trying to society, like change society-wide as well and implement these, these better things, I think also practicing grace is gonna be key to helping that shift. And you know, I was looking through the chat as well and I think a big piece to that um, and it's kind of also what you just talked about, Sada, with separating the behavior from the personhood, because I think that gets lumped in together a lot of the time. Like, well, they're acting this way, so then they're a shitty person, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means that they just don't know, or they've made some poor choices, or whatever. And I think that that could be helpful, right? Exactly, bad action isn't a bad person necessarily. And so being able to separate these may be able to help us practice more of that grace, more of that compassion with one another as we move forward. Because I think we do wanna see change and maybe we get a little impatient with that. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm also at fault for that, right? Like we wanna see this happen and you know, how do we, what is the best way of going about that? And I think it's just like, for me, like calming my own shit down, being like, all right, no, it's okay. It will be okay. We'll work through it. Right. Um, and there was another piece in the chat that I think would be important to discuss. And I'm actually wanting, like, I'm creating a class around this as well. Um, intent versus effect. Because I think, I don't think many people have intent to harm. Some definitely do. Right. But many people don't and the effect can be harmful. And so it's important for us to like look at how do we broach both of those things? How do we validate both of those things? Especially when it comes to reporting something that could be one way or the other. If that makes sense. Okay, if there's no follow up to that, um, Walk has decided he's going to uh, bring the question up privately. So next we have Kai and then Elizabeth. Okay, yeah, I think that's a really important point, and, and thank you for thank you for just ra for, for raising that, um, because it's really easy to get mad. I mean, you, you see something, someone, you know, you see something that happens that hurts someone else, and, and like we all want to be a good person. And, and 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 I I I also observed the appropriation discussion about uh, and and noped out of that one, but I I feel like they like some of, some of the more some of, some of the hotter comments, um, kind of you know showed people were speaking from the heart, which is which is genuine and and valuable. But we also don't want to create a situation where we drive people away because they made an honest mistake or they said something or did something that was hurtful out of ignorance. And, you know, we come down and then we come down on them as if they did it intentionally. A lot of times, like, like if someone is being intentionally, like doing things, bad things intentionally, we'll figure that out pretty fast. And and I think that it, it is a it, it is a it, it is a, a good position to take by default to just to to, to, to not to assume bad intent, you know. Um, yeah, there's a, a message in the chat like patterns, not individual events. Like we will, you know, 
if someone's if someone's intentionally being a jerk, we'll know, and and then and we can you know, we can escalate. But if we if we start from a position of of trying to trying to educate and trying to to you know, engage constructively in a way that helps everyone involved have a better experience, both the person that was hurt and the person that caused the injury. Um, I think that ultimately is is the best will, will be the best thing that we can do. Again, because you know, part of it is this talk is about using you know creating inclusion to you know to to, to retain people. Um, you know, we we want to we want to we want to be able to to engage with with bad behavior and correct you know correct it in a way that is that that is outcome determinative and not like punishing a punishing a person or like invalidating them as a human being. That's it. Okay. Next is Elizabeth. Um, so I kind of want to touch on one other section of what you guys are talking about, because I think everything that the last few people have said is champ right on. Um, <laughs> that's a sign for champ. Um, but I also want to discuss a little bit, something that I haven't been able to discuss in any of these kind of diversity inclusion conversations that I've been in on. Some of the minority groups which don't get talked about as often as in my experience. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the fine line between ally and oppressor um, because you like accidental oppressor. Let me, let me rephrase that. You know, you can think like, I, I'm being awesome. I'm standing up for you. I am telling them you can't do that. But are we empowering the minorities to stand up for themselves? Because if we're not, then in a way we are becoming an oppressor in the situation as well. And I think that's a conversation that I'm not seeing a lot of and I would love to see more of. Um, you know, being, feeling like I can look at someone and say, what can I do to be your ally? Because I don't know every minority culture. I just know the ones that like I kind of fall into because of work or my friends or whatever. But even those, I don't know everything. So, you know, being being able to take a step back on my own humility and say, okay, guys, what can I do to empower you in this situation? I think is an important thing too. That's all. That is an excellent point, right? I mean, we've kind of danced around that a little bit by talking about talking for people and whatnot, but giving them that space and using your privilege to create a platform for people is a big part of effective allyship. A lot of people are willing to speak up and quote unquote take the heat, but they don't know when to step back. Um, and it's hard. I mean, there's no cut and dry answer there. I don't have one because it is never the responsibility of the marginalized group to come forward and educate everyone else. It wouldn't be fair of us to expect it. But at the same time, what they need is something that only they know. And so it's gonna require a lot of work in terms of doing the research yourself, finding the resources and platforms for people to come forward and speak for themselves or speak through you, but as themselves. It's hard. That's a hard one for sure. Um, and it's a problem, I think, especially in the SCA, where we are so largely homogenous, that it's very easy to kind of be like, no, 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 I know what's going on. I'm just going to go forward and do this. And then you have people of that marginalized group just kind of sitting silently, still feeling othered because you're the one taking up all of the space that you're trying to create for them. It's very hard. Um, I do also, after Sato, I want to open it up. Anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to talk um, should feel free to chime in. If you wanted to address any earlier points in the last 10 minutes, please just chime in and go ahead and bring up whatever you would like to bring up. Um, but first, His Majesty. Can you hear me? I know my connection is going in and out. Is oh. it good? Okay. And I think something is this cultural change and it's something that we see in society outside. We have to create that actually honestly safe environment where we can have a discussion like we're doing now and not make the discussion turn into 
an argument. And because some people are like, well, you don't agree with me, and then we can't talk about it. And I think it's slowly changing to where people actually, like as Elizabeth was talking about, that nobody knows everything. You got to take your humble pie and just say like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And people, we're all humans, right? So whenever you feel like you're being attacked, it's hard to draw within yourself. And once people can actually look introspectively, like look inside themselves and say, hey, maybe you have something to learn here, or maybe I can help more in a different way, I think things will start to get better. But that's something we all have to do and then remain consistent. But anyway, that's all I had, Jess. Thanks. Okay, do people have any other comments or does anyone want to address any of the things that we already kind of talked about? Uh, so I do teach a bunch of different classes. Um, a lot of the things we've covered, if you want more information about the concepts themselves, um, I teach classes that'll give more detail about what those concepts are and also a little bit more information about what they look like in the SCA, right? Um, some of what we do in the mundane world follows us into the SCA and we can't avoid that, but some of what we do in the mundane world presents a little bit differently in the SCA. So it's good to acknowledge where those pitfalls are so that we can keep an eye out for things that are maybe not what we expected. People having problems that we couldn't have anticipated because we don't do the things we do in the SCA in our everyday lives. And we don't have the same structures in place in the SCA as we do in things like our jobs or our schools. So, um, oh, I'm looking at chat because, do you wanna talk about that now? <laughs> I know people are, are chatting in chat and I wanna make sure that everyone who does want a chance to say something or to ask any questions has that time to do it um, as we wrap up because we're just about done. We will certainly um, do this again if there's interest and time can be found schedule. It seems like most people would be interested in doing this again, I think. So we'll see what we can do about scheduling that. Um, Juniper. So um, I think the big, one of the big things that's going to help us going forward is continuing to have these conversations. Um, the more times that stuff is talked about and um, put out there for people to see, they get more used to it and they, um, it's easier for, for everyone to have conversations when it's not so tense. So like a lot of the, the stuff that I dealt with, 20, 30 years ago, um, it's different than, than what is happening now. And so it took 20 or 30 years to get where we are now with this stuff. And, and I would like to think that it won't take, if we keep having these conversations, it won't take nearly that long for the people who are having, you know, all of the issues now to get where we are now with some of the other things. So I, I, yeah, just having conversations is a big deal. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree with that. Uh, people should feel comfortable participating in roundtables like this one and coming forward with their thoughts and their perspectives and their opinions. I base my classes on what people tell me they want to know more about, right? So if you come to me and you say, I need more information about this, then I can do my best to prepare something that will start the dialogue. Um, I'm also gonna invite what I like to call the, there are no stupid questions, but we know some questions are stupid. It doesn't matter, ask me. Ask me if you have a question that I can help find an answer for or speak from my own experience because we might chuckle about it together, but you will not be faced with having to do this in a place that you don't feel comfortable with. You can come to me, we can talk privately or I can reach out to other people privately and you can ask me whatever you want to know, even if you feel like that's like, I don't really want to ask it. that's fine. You can, you can ask me because I'd rather you ask me than put yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable or you're making someone else uncomfortable. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, anyone who wants to reach out to me privately, please do so. Um, thank you guys for coming. It was a great discussion. I really look forward to chatting with, 
you guys more. Have a great month.